Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Even in UFO circles, the subject of alien abduction is controversial to say the least. After all, it is perhaps one thing to see a strange object or glowing lights in the sky, but to claim to have been forcibly taken aboard these strange crafts by alien entities understandably takes a considerable stretching of the imagination. That is not to say that these claims should be dismissed. There are, of course, many accounts that span decades and stretch across the world that share such similar details, often seemingly trivial ones that we may have to come to the conclusion that something is taking place and that we can't simply dismiss people who make such claims as liars or crazy. Might there even be a connection between these apparent extraterrestrial encounters and mind control? particularly those experimented with by the CIA in the MK Ultra programs. As we will examine in this episode, there are many cases that hint heavily at mind control techniques used by the intelligence agencies in alien abduction cases, and taking that a stage further, especially when we note the many cases that speak of a human or military presence during these apparently alien encounters, is there much more of a human involvement than we might think. Is it possible that at least some cases are the work solely of some dark but very terrestrial and human agency? When we factor in the notion of alien implants and the capabilities of our own modern world, these cases take on an even more sinister turn. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, alien implants, mind control, alien abductions, and the possibility that humans might be behind all of it. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media, plus you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. In the book Underground Bases and Tunnels – What is the Government Trying to Hide?, Richard Sauter discusses, in part, the possible involvement of secretive government agencies in alien abduction and implant encounters, and possible human-engineered mind control. As Sauter points out, there are numerous alien abduction cases that hint at a human presence, perhaps even human control of the bizarre and terrifying encounters. He states that whether it may or may not be true that extraterrestrials are behind these alien abduction cases it may be the case that at least some of the alien abductions are actually terrestrial humans working covertly, and that they could be working under cover of artificially induced states of total or partial amnesia, fear, and screen memories. Sauter highlights how this could be achieved, from something as minimal as a mask and makeup so as to be made to look like a certain alien. Sauter uses a reptilian as an example, but a typical gray alien would also be equally recognizable to most people, 
to using much more sophisticated technologies so as to cause hallucinations, or even the use of psychoactive drugs, general hypnotic methods, or even using microwave radiations. Perhaps one of the best examples of a discreet human involvement in alien abduction encounters might be an encounter that occurred along the A-70 on the evening of August 17, 1992. On the night in question, two friends, Gary Wood and Colin Wright, were driving on their way to Tarbrax just outside Edinburgh when a strange object descended out of nowhere over the road before directing a curtain of white light in front of their car. There was much debate, at least initially, on the witnesses' part as to what exactly happened next. They would later find themselves in a different part of the road and missing a considerable amount of time. Ultimately, through the use of hypnotic regression, it would be revealed that they were taken onto the craft by several small humanoids. They would find themselves in a strange room with dazzling lights before then finding themselves in a featureless room. What followed appeared to be several experiments and examinations of the two abductees. Of most interest to us here, though, is that Gary would recall the presence of a mysterious man, a human, who appeared to observe the strange procedures from a far part of the room. He appeared to be wearing a collar and tie and had a military presence about him. What is interesting is that there was quite an interest by the British authorities in the case. Might this interest have been much more active than many might suspect? The fact is, this is just one such case that hints of a human involvement in alien abduction encounters. We'll turn our attention next to one of the most famous encounters in UFO history, one that appeared decades before the A-70 incident, and one that hints not only at human involvement, but one that recent revelations suggest the use of mind-altering substances being used to manipulate the witness's perception and sense of reality. There are certainly plenty of examples that hint at mind-altering substances being administered or techniques being employed during UFO and alien abduction encounters. Perhaps one of the best might be the alleged 1957 alien abduction of Antonio Vilas Boas, who claimed to have been abducted by strange entities in the São Francisco de Salas region of Brazil while working on his farm. He would further claim to have met a beautiful humanoid woman while on board, who he claimed he was gently coerced into having sex with. Even stranger, before he left, this seemingly alien woman suggested to Boas that they had conceived a child as a result of the act. As bizarre as the account seemed even to many in the UFO community both at the time and since, Boas never once wavered from his version of events until his death in the early 1990s. However, in more recent years, new intriguing information has surfaced regarding this case, mainly thanks to researcher and author Nick Redfern, who relays this information in his book Top Secret Alien Abduction Files – What the Government Doesn't Want You to Know. Redfern highlights the revelations of Bosco Nedelkovic, who informed UFO investigator Rich Reynolds of the details. Not only did Nedelkovic work for the CIA for many years, as well as other United States agencies, he was also in Brazil at the time of the Boaz incident, which perhaps makes his claims all the more credible. He would claim to Reynolds that the Boaz alien abduction was not an alien abduction at all, but was in fact an orchestrated kidnapping which several intelligence agencies of the United States were behind. What's more, the sole purpose of the abduction was to test how much the human mind could be manipulated using a combination of props and mind-altering drugs. It was essentially an in-the-field experiment of the MK Ultra program. According to Nedelkovic, the UFO that Boaz witnessed descended toward him was actually an unmarked black military helicopter. However, due to the spraying of chemicals over the field where the farmer was working as they landed, he perceived the helicopter as a UFO. Once he was incapacitated, he was taken to a secret location with several rooms inside, and several other mind-altering drugs were administered which would make him believe he was on board a spaceship. The female alien with whom he had sex was a local prostitute who was under orders as to how to act and what to say, 
including the insinuation that they had conceived a child. Further drugs were administered before he was returned to the spot where he was taken from before he was returned, waking to see the UFO helicopter rising above him. It's perhaps interesting to note the use of the female alien and the fact that the two had sex while on the apparent spacecraft. Although a lot less otherworldly, we know that intelligence agencies would often use a combination of mind-altering drugs and the services of prostitutes with their targets for a variety of reasons, not least so they could use a particular sexual act that had been committed for blackmail purposes or to ensure a person's silence or cooperation. Might the Boaz case have been a continuation on that, albeit for a different end goal? We might also turn our attention to the fact that many abductees recall being told to drink strange, often colorless liquids for a variety of reasons, but that usually includes wiping their memory or possibly replacing the events with a false recall. For example, one of the most famous cases of repeated alien abduction is that of Betty Andreessen, who would claim that following several examinations by her apparently alien hosts, was told to drink a strange liquid which was given that would have a tranquilizing effect on her. What is also of interest, and a side note to what we're discussing here, are the claims from Andreasen that she was taken to an underwater base that contained a museum of time, containing different examples of human beings throughout history. It's not clear if these were models of some kind of real humans in suspended animation. Incidentally, both the underwater base aspect and the record-keeping of human history are details that surface in many other alien abduction accounts. Another intriguing example of these strange liquids is that of Kevin, who informed UFO researcher Martin Jasek of his own alien abduction encounter in September 1987 from the North Canal Road in Yukon, Canada. During his abduction encounter, he was given a glass with a yellow liquid in it, He was told to drink the fluid as it would make him forget the encounter, something that he was told was for his own good. In this instance, Kevin claimed later that as he very much wanted to remember the incident, he took three small sips from the glass before discreetly putting it to one side. Around a decade earlier, another abduction case with an almost identical detail occurred. On the evening of June 19, 1978, the Mann family were seemingly abducted by extraterrestrials while driving along a lonely road in southern England after a brilliant white light suddenly descended on their vehicle. After seemingly blacking out a short time later, the family would awaken on a different road with no memory of having gotten there. Interestingly, John Mann would later state that he had a strange feeling that the car was almost driving itself. Even more interesting, they noticed a strange, glowing object that appeared to remain with the vehicle for the majority of their journey home. John Mann would later undergo hypnotic regression in an effort to recall that missing hour on the road just outside of Oxfordshire, as well as the fact that both he and his wife Gloria and their daughter Natasha had several vivid and intense nightmares of strange beings. Ultimately, Mann would recall being taken on board the ship along with the other members of his family and of undergoing several experiments and tests before being shown images on a strange screen of the apparent alien's crippled home planet. Even stranger, though, before they were returned to their car, the family were given colorless, fizzy drinks that they were told would help them forget, adding that they must forget or you will be exploited. Were these the same alien entities who Kevin encountered in the Yukon just short of a decade later? An even earlier example might be found in an apparent 1952 alien abduction when a resident of Burbank, California, Orfea Angelucci, encountered a strange silver disc that landed in the road in front of his car. Just prior to the disc's sudden arrival, Angelucci had felt a bizarre and intense tingling sensation that took hold of his entire body. When the disc moved away a few moments after appearing, the sensation suddenly stopped. However, In its place were two glowing spheres, which then morphed into humanoid beings, one a man and one a woman. The most intriguing details to us here, though, is that one of these humanoids handed him a goblet that he was urged to drink from. When he did so, it relieved his unpleasant sensations. 
although it wasn't drunk, the administration of a strange liquid can be highlighted in an apparent abduction encounter that occurred in Hokkaido in Japan from the early spring of 1970, although the account perhaps began several years earlier in 1967 during a trip to Jerusalem. And what's more, although it is, of course, only speculation, it might not only show another alien abduction encounter with connections to strange liquids, but also human involvement. Gene would claim that at some point during the trip, he suddenly felt possessed by a strange entity, so much so that he believed he was not completely in control of his own decisions. In fact, for the next three years, he would travel from place to place around the world and did so upon the instruction of this strange possessing entity. By early 1970, he found himself in Hokkaido, Japan. Then things turned even stranger. He was told that he would rendezvous with his brother, his homologue of the other cycle of terrestrial life, on the summit of a nearby mountain. After climbing to the summit each day for several days, he was eventually greeted by the arrival of a large spaceship-like craft which he entered when it landed. Not long after entering the craft, and of particular interest to us here, Gene was told that he would receive an intravenous injection of a rosy liquid before he could go any further. This was, he was told, for his own protection before he proceeded on into their spaceship. Might we consider, if we assume the account is accurate for a moment, that at some point during that trip to Jerusalem, he was not possessed but rather put under some form of mental control by discrete intelligence agencies? possibly through the administration of mind-altering drugs, which then planted some kind of slow release of information. Might this kind of long-running mind control over many years have been the experiment? Once more, as bizarre as it sounds, at the same time, it's not that much of a stretch of the imagination. In fact, this aspect of being called to UFO encounters is something we will turn our attention to more fully next on Weird Darkness. I have not done a live scream in a while, but I have one on the calendar now. On Saturday, September 28th, I'll be streaming live on my YouTube channel, on camera, telling stories, taking your comments and questions, and I'll even be doing a couple of giveaways during the live show. For this live scream, we'll be talking about liminal people and parallel realities. Liminal people, we know them in a variety of forms shadow people, black-eyed kids, the sleep paralysis figure of the old hag and more, even demons and angels. They may be non-corporeal, but somehow they can cross into our reality and interact with us. That's the subject of our upcoming live stream on Saturday, September 28th on my YouTube channel and on my website on the live stream page. The stream starts at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can watch the show live and send in your comments on my YouTube channel or just watch it on my website by clicking on Live Scream at WeirdDarkness.com. We are way past due for a live scream, so this is going to be fun. I'm live on camera Saturday, September 28th on the Live Scream page at WeirdDarkness.com or you can watch on my YouTube channel where you can also leave comments that I can respond to during the show. Hope to see you Saturday, September 28th. There are many people who make claims of being called by these apparently extraterrestrial encounters, and these callings come in a variety of different ways. From a strange person simply arriving out of nowhere and instructing the person to a certain meeting point, to sudden telepathic communications or even compulsions to do the same. It's perhaps interesting to recall the thoughts of the late UK UFO researcher and one-time police sergeant Tony Dodd who, after seeing a UFO for the first time in 1978, would often drive around the lonely roads of the Yorkshire Moors. 
What became of much intrigue to him was that when he did choose to embark on these drives, he would see something strange more often than not. He began to wonder whether he was somehow being called to take these drives, even if it was subconsciously. One of the most intriguing of these is an incident that can be found in the book From Deep Within the Archives of UFO Insight. While we'll not go into the account in full here, it's worth going over the basics of the Vienna Woods incident in light of our topic. The incident comes to us from the files of the veteran UFO researcher Timothy Good and involved an account relayed to him by a friend who he studied with at the Academy of Music in London, a friend he would only refer to as Bobby. The incident occurred while Bobby was studying in Vienna in October 1962. He would begin hearing strange sounds that he described as immensely smoothing as well as telepathic messages and mental visions. One particularly strange incident occurred while he was practicing violin and the sheet music disappeared before a superimposed picture of a green forest environment replaced it. He would eventually set out to the location shown in the vision, without really knowing where he was going, instead acting purely on instinct, claiming he was being guided in a particular direction. He would ultimately find his way to the Vienna woods. As he entered the woods, he recalled that he was being guided in a particular direction. Despite how deep he went into the forest, he felt no panic whatsoever. He would eventually find himself in a clearing where a saucer-shaped craft landed nearby. Three strange humanoid creatures would approach him, interacting with him for some time, even making apparent predictions about Bobby's own future before re-entering the craft and disappearing. If we return our thoughts back to the connections of mind control to alien abduction, we might be best served to return our attention back to the work of Richard Sauter, who notes that as well as the many reports of abductees being told to drink strange drinks that will seemingly blank their memory, there are many other details typical of close contact alien encounters that could further suggest mind control techniques. For example, perhaps the most repeated is the apparent almond black eyes of the alleged aliens, eyes that seem to put those who look into them in a strange, hypnotic, trance-like state. Another detail that's often associated with such encounters is the hearing of a strange whirring or humming sound. We know that certain sounds, especially when repetitive, can often contribute to putting someone in a hypnotic state. What is perhaps interesting here is that many close-contact UFO reports state these vehicles move without making a sound, but the detail of a strange humming is often reported in the immediate moments before these strange crafts appear close to the abductee. Might this suggest, then, that this sound is very much aimed at putting the person in a trance-like state? The presence of flashing and often hypnotic lights also come up in accounts of alien interaction or abduction, as does the presence of strange pulsing in the air, as well as strong aromas that suggest the presence of some kind of gas. All of these things that we've detailed are of use to those with a knowledge of hypnotic and mind control techniques. And before we dismiss notions of mind control, we might consider how easy it is for a run-of-the-mill stage hypnotist to put people under their control, or how simple repeated advertising influences many of our daily decisions, whether we realize it or not. Mind control is very real, and it just might be the case that it's used in at least some of the alien abduction encounters that continue to be reported. We might note the notion of being called goes back throughout history, most likely to the very beginnings of civilizations. For example, there are a plethora of examples in any number of ancient religious writings that speak of angels and messengers of God. Might these divine messengers, if we assumed they exist for a moment, have actually been some kind of extraterrestrial mind control communication? If this is the case, then we might suspect that aliens have had an active interest in human affairs for many thousands of years, perhaps even longer than that. And if that's true, then we perhaps have to reevaluate what alien abductions might be. Are they a continuation of interaction between aliens and human beings that have gone on since the beginning of civilization? Or might the apparent aliens that are visiting Earth today 
be just the latest in a long line of beings from other worlds over the course of thousands of years. Of course, if these types of communication and mind control techniques have been taking place for thousands of years, then what does that say about the human presence in alien abduction encounters? Might there have always been certain humans who act as a buffer between the vast majority of humanity and these alien entities, perhaps in the same way that certain humans were granted audiences with the gods in the legends of ancient times? Might this human presence actually be a disguise of the aliens themselves designed to appear human? And if so, why? We might consider also certain encounters of the modern UFO era where many of the contactees go on to issue warnings of nuclear war and the dangers to the environment. Might these apparent attempts to influence human beings in ancient times be happening still in the 20th and 21st centuries? And might the human presence be a continuation of using a select few individuals as go-betweens, if only discreetly? We'll return to some of these contemplations shortly. First, though, we'll turn our attention to alien implants and where they might sit in this already twisting enigma that is the UFO and alien question. In terms of implants, certainly around the notion of alien abduction, we usually view these things as futuristic devices, and given the fact that many of these appear to dissolve into nothing when they fall loose or are removed, we might be right to. However, the fact is such technology is already available to us and has been here for decades. How many of us, for example, have had tracking devices placed in our pets? Taking it a stage further, many employees have offered such implants to be placed in their employees' hands in order to use it as ID, with the scope potentially able to be expanded. And what's more, the technology used for these identification implants matches many descriptions given of procedures carried out in alien abduction encounters, sometimes decades before this technology was available publicly. What is perhaps also interesting is that these identification technologies used in animals feature intricate digital databases which can be used to discover the exact whereabouts of any single animal. These technologies are used mainly to track the migratory patterns of certain wild animals which can be used as clues if their numbers suddenly decreased or increased for any number of purposes. However, the simple fact is if these implants were placed into people, we could be tracked in much the same way. As Sauter notes, the possibilities and implications for political and social control are both obvious and enormous. We should make clear this is not something we're suggesting is happening on a wide scale, but might it have an element of truth with at least some of the recorded alien abduction encounters? We should also note that these implants can be used, at least in theory but based on legitimate and accepted research, to actively influence a person remotely. And while research into this, at least officially, is relatively limited, there is the possibility that these implants, if they were administered in a mass way, could be used to radically change a person's behavior, perhaps even having them hear voices instructing them in their heads or by sending images and instruction to their subconscious, having them act on these subconscious messages. Perhaps one thing of interest about many alien implant accounts from the 1980s and 1990s is that they would often drop out of people's bodies and then dissolve in the most bizarre way. Given how durable the implant used on animals are today in the 21st century might, if we assume there is a human connection to at least some alien abduction encounters, these earlier cases have been the result of a less long-lasting and durable implant, essentially earlier prototypes of what has seemingly been perfected today? Might it be the case that these alien implants, whether their source is one of extraterrestrial origin or a terrestrial one, could be used on abductees for similar reasons, to track certain people's movements or even to influence their behavior. What the purpose of alien implants might be is very open to debate. Some researchers believe they are used just the same way that many of us use them with our pets, to track them should they become lost. Might these implants be a way of giving whoever is carrying out these abductions 
whether it is aliens or a top-secret intelligence agency, the ability to find their target at any given time. You probably know about the belief by some UFO researchers that the aim of alien abductions is to produce some kind of alien-human hybrid, and this could be very much the case. David Jacobs and Bud Hopkins are but two such researchers who have made extremely compelling arguments that this is the reason and end goal of the alien abduction phenomenon. Do we assume that taking steps to attempt to block the memories of these abductions is a moral one on the alien's part? While it is a possibility, we might assume to enter into such a program essentially against the will of the humans involved would mean such moral concerns would remain unaddressed. In short, what would these potential alien abductors have to gain from saving their specimens from the harrowing memories of their ordeals? However, what if we assume that these alien abductions are the result of human beings as opposed to extraterrestrials, which we'll explore a little further next? We would imagine then that the perpetrators would very much have a lot to gain from ensuring those involved in the program recalled as little as possible about the experience. Might it suggest then that there is some kind of human breeding program, possibly one that operates across and with disregard to international borders and certainly outside the widely accepted human rights of the world? As Richard Sauter points out, such a speculative organization whoever they might be and where they might work from, would have to operate in absolute secrecy, perhaps even from the governments of the world. And the use of mind control and mind-altering drugs to distort the memories of those they abduct, as well as the use of implants to track each and every one of those who have unwittingly and unwillingly entered into this speculative breeding program, would all go to maintain such secrecy and even deniability. Essentially, while it might be easy to dismiss claims of alien abduction as nothing but intense dreams and hallucinations, if we consider that these undoubtedly bizarre encounters are being carried out by a dark human agency under the guise of extraterrestrial visitors using drugs and mind control techniques for unknown reasons, then these assertions should be of concern to each one of us. It is to the persistent claims of a human presence during alien abduction encounters and what that means that we will turn our attention to next when Weird Darkness returns. Hey, weirdos! Oh, hey there, it's me, Darren Marlar. What are you doing here? I'm here to tell people about the next Weirdo Watch Party. You don't remember me. <laughs> are you kidding? You're Bella Lugosi, you're a legend. That's why we're showing your film, Spooks Run Wild, on Friday, September 27th. We ain't waiting for nothing, we're going right now. Well, you can visit the page right now if you want to. The Monster Channel page does have horror movies and horror hosts 24 hours a day. Uh, But the movie I'm here to tell you about is just Friday night, September 27th. It's hosted by Horror Hotel's Lamia the Vampire. She's a vampire like Bella Lugosi. It says here that in the night he prowls about seeking new victims, and in the daytime he sleeps in a coffin. Well, let's wait till daytime. The East Side kids hear about a monster killer roaming the countryside, and when one of them gets shot... (laughs) uh, I don't think that's funny, but anyway... Uh, when one of them gets shot, they seek aid at an old mansion, and they run into Bella Lugosi. You scared the health out of me. Did you just say scared the health out of you? I haven't heard that one before. Anyway, the fun begins Friday night, September 27th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch, so tune in at showtime, watch the movie with me and all the other Weirdo family members, and even join the chat during the film for more fun. We're always cracking jokes during the movies, and this is a horror comedy, so it'll be even more fun. (laughs) It's Lamia from Horror Hotel presenting Bella Lugosi in the horror comedy Spooks Run Wild, Friday night, September 27th. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-horror movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV, and we'll see you Friday night, September 27th.
If there is a human presence in these many alien abduction incidents, what might that mean? Does it mean that these encounters are nothing more than human-led abductions for reasons unknown that are masked in the most extreme way with such bizarre implanted memories? And perhaps more importantly, what might the reasons for carrying out such missions be? Does it lend potential credence to the assertions that many of us do operate under some form of mind control, as preposterous as the notion is to most? As unlikely as that might be, we should remind ourselves once more that the technology and know-how, at least potentially, is already available to us. And while it is most unlikely that such a widespread operation would have taken place over many decades, it is certainly not impossible. Perhaps even more so if only a small number of the population is targeted for such a speculative experiment. Might we consider that this aspect of targeting is where implants and possible aspects of mind control or calling come in, so as to conduct a widespread experiment hidden behind the notion of alien abduction, which would in turn allow those involved to deny such outlandish and bordering on absurd claims. And if this is the case, that these encounters are by and large the result of human-led experiments, or the many reports of strange craft that move in ways unknown to us be the genuine result of advanced vehicles or as the result of mass mind manipulation? Or might this human involvement be one that is of equal involvement with a genuine alien race? Might it suggest, for example, there was some kind of deal secretly worked out behind closed doors? Are the respective aliens and human, often military personnel, often reported by witnesses exactly as they recall them to be? If so, is this human presence there in an observing or even supervising capacity possibly to ensure abductees are treated with pre-agreed-to conditions. There are, after all, many UFO researchers who suggest that a deal for alien technology in return for access to the members of the human population was agreed to in the mid-1950s, and while there's no solid proof of this, it is perhaps interesting to note that the technological revolutions began shortly after, while at the same time, alien abduction cases began to be reported even if only from a speculative point of view. Or might this human presence have something to gain as much as the extraterrestrials themselves, possibly working together towards some kind of unknown but shared end goal? It would be hard, even for the most open-minded of us, to accept that such a world-changing secret could be kept out of the public arena for such a long time. However, we might also note that the fact we are discussing the notion due to alleged leaked documents and whistleblower testimony might suggest that the secret hasn't been so masterfully kept after all, even if most people reject, perhaps rightly, such claims. Whatever the connections and reasons might be, the fact that there is an apparent human presence during many of the alien abduction encounters on record means we should keep the suggestion on the mental back burner at the very least. Perhaps we're best served to wrap this section up by using the thoughts of the previously mentioned Richard Sauter, who stated that there were multiple groups, both governmental or private, that have access to the money, personnel, equipment, materials, and expertise to stage a convincing alien abduction episode. Sauter continues that these agencies include but are not limited to organizations from the police, major corporations, various intelligence, military, and government agencies right the way up to giants such as the United Nations and NATO, and even international crime syndicates and fraternal orders. Indeed, the UFO and alien question has the potential to take us down connecting avenues we didn't even know existed, much less travel down. We might also consider the more positive experiences of alien abduction, those that tell of pleasant interaction warnings of humanity's collective behavior regarding such things as nuclear weapons, and the general disregard for the environment. While these kinds of potential abductions, or perhaps a better word would be encounters, still occur today, they were seemingly more prevalent in the 1950s and early 1960s accounts. As the 70s and 80s unfolded, alien abduction encounters took on a more consistently ominous feel to them. 
Might these also be a part of some highly secret and long-term experiment carried out the same as those, speculatively, behind the often reported harrowing type of abduction involving medical experiments? Perhaps even used as some kind of control to the far-reaching experiment or program? Or might we consider that these positive abduction encounters are themselves the result of false memories purposely implanted? We asked earlier, for example, what an alien race carrying out these experiments would have to gain from implanting false memories to replace a likely terrifying encounter. Might it be simply to build up a certain amount of trust and, in turn, control over the abductee, particularly if that abductee was to be abducted several times? Or might these positive abduction encounters be engineered so as to have those who experience them speak about them and pass on a predetermined message? Or might these differing alien abduction encounters be simply due to the fact that there is, as some UFO researchers have suggested for some time, multiple alien races visiting the Earth all the time? Whether there is a connection between mind control and alien abduction, something that implants might play a key role in, is a debate that will continue to be contemplated at least by some in the UFO community. Ultimately, as we ask more and more questions regarding the UFO and alien question, the more questions arise. Indeed, we might imagine that the interactions with human beings and aliens from another world would be a complicated and drawn-out affair, much different, for example, than the ideas of flying saucers landing on the White House lawn that was presented in many of the early science fiction movies of the early UFO era. If, though, at least some of the alien abduction cases are the result of human-engineered mental manipulation, possibly involving mind control and the use of implants, then the entire question of what UFOs and their apparent occupants might be becomes distorted in the extreme. Might many of these alien abduction encounters be nothing more than a continuation of the MKUltra mind control experiments of the intelligence agencies of the United States? Experiments, remember, that were also worked on by Nazi scientists during the Second World War and were then, at least partially, transplanted to the United States through such missions as Operation Paperclip that saw the Americans and the Soviets scramble to grab the finest Nazi scientists for their own ends following the end of the conflict. Perhaps one more thing to consider, and something that altogether makes the already murky waters that much murkier is that many of the alien abduction encounters could be very real and that these early abduction encounters were then seized upon and used for the purposes of such bizarre experiments. Such a notion would put the battle for information on two different fronts, forcing us to consider a wealth of other possibilities and possibly diluting research and thought into one particular area. Indeed, This might even be by design by those apparent shadowy agencies that appear to pull the strings from behind the scenes. There is perhaps so much to consider when we look at what the truths might be around the UFO and alien question. Perhaps too much for one researcher alone, but certainly not beyond our collective efforts. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. And please leave a rating and review of the show in the podcast app you listen from. Doing so helps the show to get noticed. You can also email me anytime with your questions or comments through the website at WeirdDarkness.com. That's also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Content in this episode was written by Marcus Louth for UFOinsight.com. You can find a link to the original article in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. And a final thought from Wayne Dyer, 
If you believe it'll work out, you'll see opportunities. If you believe it won't, you will see obstacles. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.